بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر أن الله أنزل من السماء Come from 
and how can we implement that into our communities in the future, inshallah. So the first person I wanted to introduce up to the stage is Sheikh Amar Shukri. You know, he needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway, even though he hates it. Um, first off, you know, he's a very decorated speaker. I listen to his stuff all the time. Um, and he, you know, studied under Sheikh Hakim al Hajj, or I should say Dr. Hakim al Hajj, Sheikh Wayne Bissouni, among many other decorated scholars. He's an instructor of another, the Imam of the River Oaks. <laughs> When I said I hate introductions, it's not because I'm trying to be humble or anything like that. I just hate them. Just like with a picture. Okay, go ahead. Okay. There we go. So you guys got his introduction. Um, so Sister Mariama is also someone who's very active in the community. She's a senior at Hunter College, um, and she's you know studying public health and public policy, and she's pursuing. Uh, a career in racial justice, especially when it comes with like discrepancies in public health. She's a volunteer and an avid student at another, as well as many other Muslim community-based organizations in the Queens, I'm sorry, in the Bronx. Gotta get it right. Um, and yeah, I mean, I know you guys don't want to listen to me. You guys came from speakers. So we'll have that intro. Yeah. Is this loud enough? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, like we said, my name is Mariama. Hi. I was senior at Hunter, but today I'm not here to represent Hunter and Jose. Let's see in the back. What's up? Uh, I'm here to represent Amal Gurbis too. So Amagr does traveling Islamic seminars on topics related to all aspects of Muslim life that are relevant to us in every single way you can imagine possible. I'm part of the New York chapter of Amagr Institute that's called Gabila Tlaiba. And our next event is actually coming up pretty soon. It is a one-night event called Silver Linings, Rising Above the Storm with Gustava Yasmin Bukhari. If you're interested, there's some little cards on the table with all the information you're going on the flyer. But today, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Super Roots, which is a seminar we held last year with Sheikh Abdul Bakhi who is a Sheikh and a historian on this matter. I am definitely not, but alhamdulillah, it's an honor for me to be here and a great way to end off Black History Month. So, Musab, the next slide, please. Like I said, full disclaimer, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a historian, I was just a student in the class and I tried to study the information and come here and tell it to you guys. So I might not be able to answer your questions, but like I said, I do want this to be a discussion. So if you have anything you want to add, just chip in any time. Let's make this a discussion. I might not be able to answer your questions. But if you do want to follow along and get more information, Sheikh Abdullah has actually written a book on this topic with the same name, Deeper Roots. You can find it on his website and you can find it on Amazon. And our lovely Kabila has also prepared uh, a PPN, which, is, which stands for Project Professional Notes. They type up all the notes to the seminar, including the stuff that's in the seminar book and the things the Sheikh said. So even if you didn't attend the class, you get everything. And it's available online for free. So if you want, want to follow along right now, you can go to thelyba.org and then click on seminar notes, and this should be the first one on that website. Right, so why do we study history? But before we talk about that, let's talk about why we don't like studying history. So anyway, why don't you guys like studying history if you don't? Why don't you like history class in school? I didn't like history class in school because of the essays. I never did well with DBQs or tell me why this fight that happened 100 years ago caused this revolution. I was never good at that. But why do you guys think? Yeah. Um, I hated history because it was only American history and it was boring. Ooh. It's a fact. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I see some of you in the audience. Yes. Actually, it was a complete opposite. You like this? Yeah. World history. Why did you like world history? Yeah. Okay, American history is pretty boring. Yeah. don't like history is because we don't see ourselves with what didn't it. Like you guys said, 
our history is very Eurocentric based in school from kindergarten all the way through high school and then into college as well. So a lot of people don't like it because they don't really see themselves in it. I know that I was 18 the first time that I found out that Barack Obama wasn't the first black person to run for president. And I was really offended when I found that out because we did a whole year of AP US history and we're talking about Nixon and Watergate, but we can't talk about the other black people who tried to run for president before Barack Obama actually won the one. So that was one thing that really resonated with me. But let's get to the next slide and talk about why we should talk about history. Because one third of the Quran is stories. And then Allah tells us in the Quran, uh, in Surah Yusuf, surely there was in their stories a lesson for the men with understanding. And then in Surah Araf, so relate the stories in order that they may reflect. This is an order, a command from Allah, to relate the stories and reflect on them. Allah wants us to learn from history, right? We all know the saying that history repeats itself. Those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. I remember at a different al Maghrib seminar, Sheikh Ali Bassini said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme, right? And when you study history, you do find those things that, this happened a little bit different, but it sounds a lot like what happened 50, 60 years ago, right? Please. The next thing is that history does show us universal fixed principles, and that's what we find when we study history. We see that some of the similar things that happen in this region of the world happen in that region of the world, and we see how humans are more alike than we are different in a lot of ways. Next slide, please. Someone else said Eurocentrism is the reason we don't like studying history. I argue that Eurocentrism is the reason we're in <laughs> this mess a lot. We're taught that Europe is the center of the world, and we're taught that the white way is the right way a lot of times, right? I know that personally, Disney Channel and teen movies ruined my life because they told me that high school is supposed to look one way, college is supposed to look one way, after you graduate college, you're supposed to move out and do this and that and that. When that's not what's in my culture, that's not what I experience. But when you see on TV, it's all the white way is the right way, and you feel like anything you do different than that is wrong, right? Another thing is that, like we said, we teach history from a very Eurocentric point of view, right? The, Middle e the medieval period is called the Dark Ages only because they were having the Dark Ages in Europe. That's when Europe had regressed into feudalism. But at the same time, in Africa, in the Middle East, we were having the Islamic Golden Age. Yeah, when we talk about it in history, we talk about that as the Dark Ages because it was the Dark Age in Europe, right? Greenwich Mean Time is the international standard for the world. Why not Bronze Mean Time? <laughs> Why not that in time, right? And related to Eurocentrism is the fact that Africa is distorted on maps even to this day. Maps do not accurately uh, reflect how big Africa actually is from the past, even up to the maps that we see in all of our classrooms today. So, is that the last slide, the previous slide, please? So, this is actually from CNN. It's called Why Do Western Maps uh, Make Africa Look Small? And CNN themselves say that this is to diminish the significance of Africa in our minds, because the size matters. So you see on our maps that you might find in your classroom, Canada actually looks bigger than Africa. But if you look at it in Africa size, Africa can absorb Canada. Next slide, please. If you look at the two sides of Africa, the United States and just about every single colonizing power that laid claim to Africa can all fit inside Africa. Africa can swallow them up all whole, right? But on mass, we're taught that Africa is smaller than that because it diminishes the significance of the power that Africa holds in our minds. So. Next up. We're taught that Greeks and Romans are the bastions of civilization, yet Africans and Mesoamericans built pyramids with perfect geometry, calculus, and physics centuries before the Greco Romans. Over here on the left, you see the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is built by Nubians, which were the Black Egyptians. And then on the right, there is a pyramid from Central slash South America. I couldn't find a direct link. It could be the Mayas, Incas, or the Aztecs, if anyone knows. Please chime in, but I couldn't find a direct link on that. Now I'm going to talk about the meat of why we came here. So African presence in the Americas before Columbus, and more specifically African American Muslim presence in the Americas before Columbus. Next slide. I think previous slide text. <laughs> okay, so you guys know who that is. All right, so we know that Africa was the first safe haven for Islam, right? Who knows what I'm talking about? Africa. Abyssinia, yes. So before the first, before the second Hijra, actually, to Medina, a group of Sahaba left Mecca because they could afford to. The persecution was really bad. They went and they settled in Abyssinia, uh, which is in modern-day Ethiopia, and they were welcomed there by the Najashi, which was their word for king. And this Najashi, Najashi was a Christian king, but he was very open and welcoming, and he was not unjust. 
So the Muslims went there, they lived under him peacefully, and that Najashi actually accepted Islam. We know that Africa has a rich history, literally. Gold was so abundant in West Africa. Who knows which country in Africa is called the Gold Coast? Yeah. Formerly Ghana. Formerly Ghana, yes. Fun fact, gold was so prevalent in Ghana that you could trade a kilo of gold for a kilo of salt. They just had so much that it was like, we need salt to preserve our food, we have all this gold, let's trade it one for one. That's how rich Africa was. So two West African kings had accepted Islam in the 11th century. We have Wajibi, which was the king of Tafrir, which is now known as Senegal, in 1035. And then Kayama the Sise, who was the king of the Ghana Empire, and he accepted Islam in 1076. But the people in those regions had been accepting Islam even before their rule was converted. But of course, after the rule converts, it does give that religion more clout and more people start to convert. So, you guys saw a sneak peek on the next slide. But one African Muslim king was the richest known man in history. Who knows who that is? Bansa Musa. So, four places Bansa Musa's riches at somewhere between 400 and 600 billion dollars. So he's most famous for his Hajj caravan in 1324. He carried so much gold with him that he changed the economy in every single country he visited. Uh, my friend May here is often quick to point out that he depressed the economy in Egypt. He caused deflation in, inflation in Egypt with all the gold and actually depressed the economy for 10 years. Um, but he did a lot of other good things too. So on his way back from Hajj, he did bring books, scholars, architects, and missionaries, and he tried to build masjids and empowered Muslims everywhere he went, both on his way to Hajj and on his way back. Next so on his way back from Hajj, uh, he stopped in Timbuktu and founded Sankare University in the Sankare Masjid in Timbuktu, Malawi. Sankare Masjid started off as just a madrasa, but then it became a full-fledged university serving over 20,000 students. And they did not just teach religious studies, they also uh, taught math, science, and medicine, right? Even in this, Timbuktu, we know, was the bastion of Islamic knowledge and civilization. It's sort of like Baghdad and Iraq. That was Timbuktu in Mali. And in their big, their famous university, they're not just teaching Islamic sciences because they know that's not all that's important to living a full civic life, right? They're teaching science, math, and medicine, all of these great things. So Timbuktu had become a principal staging point on the route to Hajj. It was a central point for scholars and knowledge and the dissemination of Islamic ideas. So on this picture here, we have a picture of the Sakura Masjid in Mali. So you might be asking yourself, okay, Mariama, that's really cool, but the topic here is African Muslim presence in the Americas. So how is Matsu Musa relevant? That's a great question. <laughs> While he was on Hajj, Matsu Musa was interviewed by an informant of a geographer named Al Omari. And Al Omari wrote a book. And in his book, he wrote that Mansa Musa had a predecessor, who I believe was his older brother, his name was Mansa Abu Bakr. So just like Najashi or Caesar, Mansa is a title for the king. Mansa Abu Bakr had actually left Mali to discover the limits of the neighboring ocean. Next slide, please. So that is a picture of Mansa Abu Bakr on the ocean. So Mansa Abu Bakr left with 2,000 ships, 1,000 for his men, and 1,000 for his water and supplies. And he never returned back home. But we do have evidence that he and his men landed in South America and perhaps made their way all the way up to the present day United States. Exactly. So we do have history of Mandinka inscriptions. Anyone here Mandinka? Squad? What's up? Yeah? Mandinka is a language spoken in West Africa, Gambia, Senegal, Mali, all those areas. So we found Mandinka inscriptions on rocks in rocks and stones, starting in Brazil, going all the way up the Amazon into Peru. And some people say that there's more evidence that they made it all the way to the US. Muslims have become so integrated in that society, we know that they never went back to Africa. But they actually stayed there and integrated themselves into society, such that when the Spanish conquistadors came, they saw these black uh, South Americans and labeled them as indigenous groups. That's how much they had integrated themselves into the population. But unfortunately, we don't have much more information on what they did there because the Spanish conquistadors had a policy of scorched earth which means that as they went through the area, they burned all of these records, so any more information or any more evidence we could have had of these Mandikas in the Americas is unfortunately lost. But here are two things we do have. This is a Peruvian portrait vessel, which does look like an African memory in Kubi, right? And then there's another book by Ivan Van Zegnita called The Came Before Columbus. 
And a very interesting thing is that a lot of these scholars who claim and they just put their foot down that there were Africans in the Americas before Columbus, before slavery, they're refuted a lot in the historian community. They're told, like, no, they're crazy, like, don't listen to them. But these people are still adamant about putting their things out there. So I tried Googling it. You can try Googling it. You might not find a lot of information, but you kind of have to dig deep, like Google roots, to find it. But Jean Abdullah has a book. Uh, this professor Ivan has a book, so you can look into it more. How many slaves were brought to America from Africa? Who knows? Um, around, oh wait, all the slaves were. All the slaves? I think it was 12,000 to 25,000. 12,000? I said, I'm sorry, 12 million, 12 million, 25. 12 million, 25 million? Any other guesses? Anyone know? In the million range? Next slide, please, Ms. Alvin, don't go, please. None. No slaves were brought to America from Africa. Next slide, please. African people were stolen from their homes and enslaved. <laughs> so we have an estimate of about 305,000 uh, were taken from West Africa to present day United States of America and 12 million in the greater Atlantic slave trade. And it's likely even more than 12 million because we know that a lot of people didn't survive the passage from Africa to the Americas, whether it was because of the rough journey, we know the fact that they didn't treat these people very well on um, Board. And also a lot of slaves resisted, some held riots on board, and a lot of people did jump overboard because they would rather die than be put into bondage. But this was a very important lesson that I learned at the African American Museum in Detroit, which is that slaves weren't taken from Africa, people were taken from Africa. They were ripped from their homes and they were made slaves. Next slide, please. But we do know that the African Muslims who were on board did resist a lot. So Sheikh Omar can talk a little better about the fact that slavery as we know it in the US is nothing at all, no way similar to the slavery that is allowed under certain conditions in Islam. Not anywhere close. Islam wanted to eradicate slavery, and we see that because there's so many rewards and so many differences have their expiation in freeing slaves. We know that about 13, uh, excuse me, 15 to 30% of West Africans taken as slaves were Muslims. So the Europeans took people as slaves through kidnapping and unfortunately also purchasing because some rulers did collaborate with the Europeans and sold their people to the Europeans to be taken to the Americas and to the Caribbean for manpower. But over here we have some quotes from even Muslim rulers because Muslim leaders did resist very vocally against the slave trade. The first one is from Chef Nasruddin in Mauritania and said God does not allow rulers to raid, kill, or enslave their people. He has to, on the contrary, guard them from their enemies. The people are not made for the rulers, but the rulers are made for the people. The second uh, quote is from the Imam of Futatoro in Guinea. I won't read the quote because it's very long, but basically, if you see at the end, he says, if you come here and you try to take, your pe you try to take our people, prepare to die. <laughs> we, will not take our, we will not let our people be taken so easily. Right? So we see that African Muslims had this soul of resistance, and they weren't going to go down without a fight. Is that the next slide, please? And even the ones who were taken away did not lose that soul of resistance. Muslim slaves resisted all over on the other side. The Hispaniola slave revolt, who knows where Hispaniola is? Yes. Modern DRV. The modern island of Dominican Republic and Haiti, right? So we know that Haitians were the first uh, slave group to successfully revolt and start their own republic. So in the midst of all of that, in 1522, the first slave revolt was actually led by Senegal and the first. Senegal in the house? Ooh, ooh, me? Yes. <laughs> yes. So they were led by the Senegambian Wolof. I'm not Wolof, but you're not going to claim my people either way. And this is the first recorded slave revolt in the history of America. <coughs> On the other side, around Brazil, one of the Portuguese leaders in the colonies actually sent a letter back to uh, Prince Philip saying, stop sending Muslims. They keep revolting. Some of them actually did succeed. He's like, but they're too difficult. Stop sending Muslims. We don't want them anymore. <laughs> so, and they actually even did send some of those Muslims back to Africa. Right? So reading history and then seeing examples of West African Muslims, especially Senegambian, it really hits close to home because I am Senegambian. Uh, my parents are from Gambia, but if you look on a map, Senegal and Gambia are pretty much one. Long story, but basically colonialism is the only reason they're two different countries. But 
seeing you know my people were the ones who were taken as slaves, it really hits home for me because when I think about it, I think that that could have been my ancestors, and just my ancestors were the ones who were lucky and the ones who got to stay. No, well, not lucky because everything happens from love, but really, it could have been me on the other side. So when you see those documentaries, I really see myself there, and it's a it's a very emotional thing. But in, it also brings up the fact that I probably have cousins who are African American who I don't even know who may never know. There's actually a, an interesting book on this. It's fiction. It's called Homecoming by Yad Nasi. I don't know if anyone read it, but it follows two sisters, one who stayed and one who was taken, and their generations as they go through um, like eight generations up to present day America. And it was, it's a very emotional thing to know that you have family who were ripped away from you. So just a little side note, that's the reason why uh, black people in the Americas call themselves African American, because I can call myself Gambian American, you can call yourself Senegalese American, Malian American, right? But the people who are the ancestors of those who were taken, they don't know where they came from, because that history was ripped from them before slavery. So African is there on that side of the hyphen of African American as a placeholder, because they don't know exactly where they came from. So just when you know that history, you know, it makes it harder. Next slide. So a couple of notable enslaved Muslims as we wrap this up. The first one is Ayuba Suleiman Diallo, also known the Arabic way as Ayub ibn Suleiman, and his name is anglicized to Job bin Solomon. So he was from Bundu, Senegal, and he was enslaved and taken to Maryland. He's an Islamic scholar, he's very well read, and he was traveling to visit another area when he was captured. So when he was taken, he told his captors, like, listen, my father will pay 10 times whatever you're gonna get from me, just take me back home, but they refused. But it wasn't until he actually made it to Maryland that they realized he was literate, and so they allowed him to do scribe work. And while he was in captivity, he wrote the entire Quran from memory. He was later set free because of this treaty with uh, Morocco and the United States. So Morocco, another Muslim country, was the first country to recognize the United States as a country after the revolution. And they made this clause with the US that any Moors they had in slavery by Moors we know it as that region in um, North Africa, but back then they were talking about basically any Muslims or any African Muslims. Any more, they have to set them free. So after this treaty, uh, Ayub Jalo was freed and he was allowed to return home to Africa. The other one is Abrahman Ibn Ibrahim Asori, and there's a documentary about him that we actually watched in that class. It's called Prince of Muslims. And I believe it's on PBS or one of those other things you can view it online for free. So basically, he's a literal prince. And he was taken captive, winds up in, in the South as a slave to this man named Collins, right? So he was insisting, insisting he's a prince. The, the Collins didn't believe him. He's like, yeah, right, okay. But he started calling him Prince anyway. That was like his nickname on the plantation. Until one day he's out uh, at the market and he comes across this man who was a white man. He was lost in Africa, in Guinea, and this prince found him helped him get back to civilization, helped him, make, helped him make his way back. So then when they met again in America, this man who felt so indebted to Prince Abdurrahman for saving his life, he went to his master and was like, I will free him, give me your price. But you know, Prince was so valuable to the master that he refused to free him. But in his will, after he died, he actually allowed Prince to go free, him and his wife. Um, so he and his wife went on this tour around the country, trying to raise money to free their children. They couldn't free all of their children, I believe they were only able to free three of them, but they did go home. They didn't get back to Guinea, they went and they settled in Liberia. And at the end of the documentary, it's like a little full circle thing. One of the descendants of people who went back to Liberia came back to the South and met with his cousins who had been left behind, right? And all of them are reading their names at the end, and a lot of the names have been preserved too. A lot of them were named Prince Collins or the middle name was Prince. It was just beautiful to see that that full circle, you know, those cousins, that barrier that was created through a lot of violence actually coming around full circle. So those are two notable Muslims. There are a lot more, but we do know that African Muslims have left a legacy of taqid and purity in the Americas. And many of the African diaspora are now actually returning to their Muslim roots. In South America, there is a tribe called the Garifuna people, and they are expected, they're suspected to be direct descendants of those 2,000 ships that came with Mata Abu Bakr. They stayed as their own little enclave, they still have some cultural characteristics that are Muslim and Muslim, and a lot of them are actually returning to Islam to this day. So this concludes my talk, but last slide please. I do have some takeaways for us. The first is that history does not start or end in Europe, as you all thought. 
right? And it's up to us now that we know better and we do have these resources to expand our minds and remove Europe from the center of our point of view. Second is that Islam is a part of African history and then Africa is a part of Islamic history, as you see here. Part of the golden age of Islam, Mansa Musa, the richest man in history, was African. <laughs> We found out about him because of his amazing caravan that led to Hajj. Unfortunately, part of the reason that the transatlantic slave trade did start was because of that caravan, because the Europeans started in the region of Egypt heard about this rich king from West Africa with all this gold, which launched the, the expeditions to the west of Africa to find that gold. But the third being that Islam is part of American history and America is part of Islamic history. I was at the Black Muslim Initiative event at NYU last week, and I met a sister there, she's very nice, she's about my mom's age, and she was telling me that before the 90s, when people thought of Muslims, they thought of black people in America, right? Because you guys know that before 1965, America's got racist history, it's still racist, but 1965, the Immigration Act allowed a lot of our parents or grandparents to be able to even come to this country, right? So before that, all Muslims in the U.S. were mostly black. And up until the 90s, when people thought black, they thought black Muslims. It wasn't until that narrative started to change, and that's how we see how prevalent or how pervasive the media is to be able to change the way we perceive everything. Even people who were cognizant, old enough to be cognizant in the 90s, when they think Muslims, what did they think? Huh? Yeah. Arabs, what else? Yeah. Terrorists. Arabs and terrorists. People who are old enough to remember when black Muslims were the only Muslims in America, now when they think of Muslims, they think of Arabs and terrorists. And that just shows us how pervasive the media is and being able to affect the way we view the world. But we should still remember that Islam is part of American history and America is part of Islamic history, and that's because of black people. And the fourth being that Muslims were known for their resistance. The Portuguese said, stop sending Muslims here as slaves because they won't do it. Right? But this is a lesson to me first before all of you, but are we? Are, are we known now in America as, you can't play with Muslims, they won't stand for it, you know? Are we known for resistance to this day? So that is the end of my presentation, and I thank you all for listening. Um, Assalamu alaikum. That was... starts, I'd like to ask Sheikh Hamar to the stage, um, and I just wanted uh, both Sheikh Hamar and Sister Maria to give a very brief anecdotal uh, about their experiences, uh, about what it means to be both Muslim and Black in America, uh, before we actually get into the Q&A, inshallah. So, about what it means to be Black and Muslim in America. I'm first generation Gambian American, so my parents came here from Gambia in the 90s. I grew up in the Bronx. What? Any Bronx here? What's up? Park Yes? Yeah? What's up? <laughs> anyway, so I grew up in the Bronx in Park Chester, and funny thing for me is growing up, I thought that America was 50% black and 50% white because that's just all I saw around me. Like, I, I was just surrounded by black people in this place. Like, I didn't think that blacks were only 20% of the population, but that just goes to show you, like they mentioned, I study public policy. So when you study policy, you get to understand, again, how history plays a role, how redlining and other sorts of policies systematically and deliberately place black people or people of color in certain pockets and not there. So the fact that I thought that the world around me was all black and the fact that we're only 12% of the population, like that was just a big thing for me. It was a big shock for me when I actually found out. Because that's just all I saw around me. So, black and, and Muslim, the funny thing is, so I started when you when I was 16. And before that, a lot of people didn't outwardly know I was Muslim, and unless they were either West African or they could recognize West African, so they knew that West Africans were mostly Muslim. So, before I started when you people didn't assume that I was Muslim. Um, and when I did start when you people asked me if I converted. 
Um, they asked me, like, was I forced? Did I get married? Like, all, all this other weird stuff. But one thing is, I can't speak for everyone on the black Muslim experience because the black Muslim experience isn't a monolith. There's like the New York, and then there's the suburban, and then there's a black um, immigrant experience, and then now here I am, the second generation black immigrant experience, and then the African American experience I could talk about because people have been here for generations and even centuries. So the black Muslim experience is vast, and as I've gotten to college and just gotten to meet more people, how I've gotten to know more about what that is. But for me, I've seen both the positives and the negatives, and of course, the only negatives come from just societal pressure or societal misconceptions. But I will share, and it's a positive story. So I work at a test center in lower Manhattan, and when I first started, I started off as a proctor, and I just proctored the test and grades and all that. So the exam administrator, uh, this was just a couple months ago, he is a white guy from New York, but he grew up in Jersey around all black people. Uh, so it was kind of funny, but he told me just a couple months ago that when I started working there over a year ago, he was a little skeptical when he first saw me because he saw me like black, hijab, he, and he told me straight up, he was like, I was thinking like, mm, terrorist? And I was like, really? So I, he was like, yeah, for real. But as positions opened up, I would encourage my friends to apply. We're also black Muslim hijabis, not just Gambian. And he told me that just seeing us interact with each other, the way we just we have different styles of dressing. I'm very fashionably challenged with my other friends to help me put outfits together. Um, but just seeing us interact with each other, just the kind of jokes we tell are the same things that any kind of girls would tell each other. Just seeing us interact broke down all those stereotypes in his mind. So I've always questioned because I can be very oblivious of those things, how people perceive me when I come into a space. Black, physically Muslim, people ask me like, they just assume that I'm an immigrant. I don't know, even though people tell me I sound like a white girl, other people just assume that I'm an immigrant. Um, but things like that with Scott tell me that I don't need to worry about how other people are going to perceive me because I just have to come into a space and be my full self and that will just speak for itself. And I don't need to worry about anyone else's misconceptions, you know? Is that your Khairan? Or Sheikh Amar wanted to share something really quickly before we went into the question of trouble. I think, alhamdulillah, uh, <clears throat> not just kind of off the top of my head, something that comes to mind about the, specifically the black American Muslim experience. I think it's to be admired and feared at the same time. And what I mean by admired is that growing up, I grew up in Queens and I grew up with a lot of uh, non-black Muslim friends who dressed black, talked black, uh, used uh, African American or black words of endearment or affinity or what have you. <laughs> and at the same time, we turn around and call black people kalus, right? Which is the N word in Urdu. Or just black in Urdu, right? In a very derogatory way. And I remember we like being 12 or 13, I'm just saying like, this is so conflicting, like you're looking down on black people and you are dressed completely, uh, you know, copying your favorite rapper or your favorite basketball player or your favorite. So that conflict, right, is admiration and at the same time caution at the same time. So I feel like that's always been my experience. It's always been my experience uh, in the immigrant community and being from the immigrant community. Well. So that's what I want to do. Um, you know, with that, we're going to move on to the first question, inshallah. By the way, we do have an open Q&A. We just wanted to get through our um, questions that we had structured, inshallah. Um, I believe these were, I know these were sent Sister Mariama uh, for him. Okay, so, so the first question is, why is it important that black history is taught not only in U.S. classrooms, but in Islamic history? And why is it not taught more widely? How does this gap in teaching affect black as well as non-Muslim black youth? I mean, non-Muslim black youth, yeah. Uh, Non-black Muslim youth and communities. All right, who wants to start? So why is it important that black history is taught? I think with regards to, to even go back to the question of history, why is history important? History is important because it gives you a sense of possibility you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He says, we relate to you, we relate to you, O Muhammad, the stories of the Prophets from before, 
so that your heart can be solidified, your heart can be given firmness, that you be content and recognize that you know what, no matter what it is that you are going through, there are people who have gone through something similar from before, and they survived, and they thrived, and they came out okay. So you will come out okay as well. And so when we learn history, we are inspired. When you learn about, in this particular case, 12 million people or 15 million people or whatever it is, traversing the Atlantic and building a nation and uh, finding their roots and inspiring. So all of that inspires a person and allows you to recognize that what we go through is really nothing compared to what people before us have gone through. So if they were able to survive, then we should be able to survive and thrive and succeed. Uh, another reason why we learn history is because history allows us to, to create bonds of empathy and compassion with each other. From the immigrant community, I've seen this actually. And that is, I've, I've seen people ask the question, like what's, what's up with the African American community? Can somebody please explain to me? If I'm an immigrant from Pakistan or from Egypt or from Morocco or from wherever, and I came in 1994, and now I have a house in Long Island, a mansion, because I came, I landed, I studied, I worked, I got a job, advanced in my career, and I'm living the American dream. Why are these, like why is the African American community struggling so hard, they've been here for 400? Like America's the land of opportunity and dreams, right? Without history, you, you, you can't recreate that relationship. You won't understand. Uh, and the way that I like to explain that to the immigrant community is, well, how's your country doing? Okay, how's your country doing? I mean, it, it's been given independence 70 years ago, or 90 years ago, or 100 years ago. Colonizers have left a long time ago. So, what's up with your country? How do you fix that problem yet? And they'll, they'll answer and they'll say, well, the colonizers didn't just leave, they left behind systems that would keep us down. Whether that's through debt, or whether that's through, I mean, you, you even Africa's borders are straight lines. Do you understand how crazy that is? Europe, Euro, European borders are not straight lines because the borders are shaped around a people who have the same identity. They're French, they're all Francophones, they all have a shared history. But I'm from Sudan. Do you know how many different peoples there are in Sudan that have nothing to do with each other? They have no shared uh, language, they have no shared race, no shared ethnicity, no shared uh, religions. But what the British did was, this was their method. They would gather people that don't have any shared commonalities to make them always have been fighting. And guess who they're going to have to refer back to to resolve their disputes? Go back to the colonizers, right? Go back to the British. So they left behind these systems. And if that's the case with regards to what they were doing with regards to countries, don't you think they would do the same thing to a people within their own country, of course? So there are lots of systems meant to disenfranchise and everything from the Anyway, long tangent, but these are some of the things that I wanted to share. Why is it not more taught more widely? I don't think we have enough storytellers, to be honest. History, one of the reasons why history is unattractive is because it focuses on dates, focuses on names, without really telling people stories. When, and that's why, look, whenever you have a movie that comes out about a, a person, a historical figure, if the movie is done well, you'll watch three hours on Abraham Lincoln deliberating on one single point. You will watch a movie about William Wallace and you have no idea who William Wallace was before you watch Braveheart. And you will watch about a, an imaginary figure and takes you to an imaginary country called Wakanda. Like, you will watch stories. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلْنَا نَقُصُّ Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ Allah says, we, we're to, when it comes to Qur'an telling history, it tells it in the form of stories. And it removes all of those like details, like the stuff that we don't like about history, dates and anything that doesn't assist the flow of the story and the major themes and the major points, it's removed. And so, um, just to wrap it up, I think as a Muslim community, we don't have enough creatives and we don't have enough storytellers to make our stories consumable by the public. But we do have a lot of doctors and engineers out there. That was sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. Um, but the only couple of things that I would like to add on to that is that when youth aren't taught uh, this black Muslim Islamic history, 
it creates these divides between the community because a lot of the people who did, even before I went to Jabra, after asking if I was Muslim or if I converted, they were other Muslims. Like, I went to wrong science, and the MSA was like 99% Bengali. They were like two Thakis and me. <laughs> right? There were like three black kids at a time in the MSA. Um, and a lot of people who asked me if I converted were Muslims because they just don't know that Africa's got a lot of 90 plus percent majority Muslim countries. So when we don't disseminate that fact, we're, we're cutting ourselves off from like half the Ummah. You know? I've got it written down. Oh, I wish I brought my notebook with me. But there are actually more Muslims, I believe, in Nigeria than on the entire Arabian Peninsula. There's more Muslims in Nigeria than there are in Iraq. Senegal has a higher percentage of Muslims than Syria does. Uh, Africa is probably the only Muslim-majority continent in the world. But when we look at Africa, we, some, we seem to think that it's peripheral to the story of Islam, or that Islam is peripheral to the story of Africa. Okay, and then that also translates to me, and as students, Zainab and all is not seeing ourselves in Islamic history, right? We see what it does when, when Black Panther comes out and everyone goes to the theaters and their kentes and their wats because we gotta shop for representation. Representation means a lot to people. It shows you that I've been here, my people have been here, and there's there's a place for me here that's been carved out already. Like I just have to step into it. And then when you when you cut us off from that, we're cut off from our own history. Great answers. We're going to move on and show up to the next question. So building off of that, right, now that we establish like, how important it is for us to study black Muslim history, what lessons can we Muslims learn from black Muslims who use their religion to resist slavery and later other forms of, of that oppression or oppression? Oppression. All right. Who wants to start? So I would say to that is the key part of that question is use their religion. So, uh, Muhammad Ali's religion is basically being removed from, from him right now, right? You, you would hardly hear, he, he's being, um, what's the word, sterilized. The fact that Muhammad Ali is Muslim, you, you do not find much mention of that, except by the Muslims themselves. Malcolm X, as much as he is celebrated, Malcolm X is the one who said, America needs to understand Islam, because that is the one religion that solves the biggest problem. And so I think that of the things that we have to be cognizant of is that your strength lies in your Islam. At any time that you try to remove the race problem without referring back to the oneness of God and hence the oneness of man, you are actually doing a disservice to the solution. And you're not being either you're either not being sincere or you're being ignorant. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says a beautiful verse in Surah al fat that I would advise everybody to inscribe in their heart. He says, The Ansar in Medina had problems with each other for hundreds of years, as idiotic as racism. And Allah says, and he joined their hearts. O Muhammad, if you had spent everything that was on earth, you would not have been able to join their hearts. But Allah joined their hearts. What that shows us is the unification of hearts is something that is done by the divine. If you put forward every program and with all of the resources and all of the funds and all of the educational campaigns and marketing campaigns and commercials and all of that, you wouldn't be able to unite people's hearts. And so what you have to do is you have to direct them towards the one who will unite their hearts. I can't even come after that. But the only thing I would add is if you want to hear more about Islam spoken in this context, because a lot of times when we go to Halakat or or khutbas, they don't focus on the role that we as Muslims have in our civil society, with our civic responsibility and our responsibility, which is rooted in Islam, to resist all forms of oppression um, and to fight for good in this society. A person who talks about this a lot and can fit this into any subject is Sheikh Sahib Wab. So if you're ever at NYU Tuesday or Thursday nights, he does his halakha, so he'll always find a way to squeeze that in. Or if you catch him doing Jamaah, he does some Jamaah good boys. Listen to him. He's also got his own um, podcast channel on Apple Podcasts, so listen to him. What I would add to that is that when people go for social justice, you have two things. You have the people who are connected to Islam, 
who don't work for social justice. And then you have the people who go out for social justice and they're not confident in actually presenting Islam as a solution. So what do they do? Is they basically adopt everybody else's platform. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Before Black Lives Matter, Black Souls Matter. My concern isn't just as a person of da'wah, that a person receives justice in this world, but that they receive justice. The Prophet Sassan didn't come because Black Lives Matter. The Prophet Sassan came because everybody's soul, soul matters in the dunya and the akhirah. But that takes confidence, right? To be able to shift the conversation and direct people to a platform that actually will solve their problems. Those were you know, amazing answers. A lot of stuff for us to think about. Um, and on that note, before we move on to the next question, inshallah, please do come up with questions, right? Because we're going to have an open QA part where you guys will be able to come up and ask any questions you guys want uh, for the panelists. So, the next question that we have is What are the greatest misconceptions about black Muslims you think people have in general? There's going to be some great answers to this if you feel it. Uh, the greatest misconceptions about black Muslims? people think in general. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a misconception. I just don't think that, I think that we do a disservice, especially, especially even though I'm a black Muslim, I'm from the immigrant community. And so I think one of the disservices that we do is kind of actually even represented in a gathering like this, right? Where it's Black History Month, African Americans, black and you're from West Africa and I'm from Northeast Africa. So where's my African American on this panel, right? So, uh, but we do this a lot. And if you'll find that in the, in the United States, as far as I'm concerned, the people who always have the greatest social currency uh, are African American Muslims. We look at the, the people who, Muhammad Ali, Malcolm X, Ibtihaj Muhammad, Mos Def, like Dave Chappelle, like whoever it is, it's always going to be the African American Muslim community who have the most social cachet. And so when we um, when we actually don't put them in front of us, we have the opportunity to actually be way more ahead, I think, than uh, where we are now, simply because at the end of the day, everybody wants to have their face in front of everybody. So. That's what I would suggest. I would suggest that you actually make sure that as an immigrant community in our programs, it has, if, if, if there's a reason to, uh, that you make sure that you put our brothers and sisters from the African American community in the forefront. You allow them to speak, I think, with regards to uh, even addressing the nation. We should always be having our brothers and sisters from the African American community, indigenous Americans, those who can't be told to go back home. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would just add that that is just indicative of the fact that even in New York, as diverse as we are, we're still a very segregated community. Um, in the Bronx, where I'm from, most of the Muslims are black, West African Muslims, but at least those are the ones that I know about, right? Of course, there are African Americans there. No big po uh, population of African American Muslims is in Brooklyn. But then I come to the MSA, and I'm still one of the like three black kids. Go to as much as I love it, like even on Maghrib and all these other things that like, bring all these Muslims from all over the city together, black Muslims are still like this very small part of it. And it's like, why? It's because we still have these divides within our own communities, you know? It's like, I understand why we need to have the masajid that cater to a specific ethnicity, because we will always have immigrants, our parents or our grandparents, the people who come, low-income workers don't have time or the money resources to stop working and just go learn English. Right? They will need Islamic services in their own languages. But as we come up as this second generation, you know, we're creating third spaces, third Muslim spaces for ourselves, we have to break out of those molds and stop limiting our Muslim community or just even our community spaces to just people of the same ethnicity as us. That's one thing that will break those, break those barriers and actually make sure that you know more than two black Muslims and they're not both African, you know? So that's all I have to add. All right, um, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to add like, my own little note in there. If we look at like how many of the first Muslim that we have, like Muslim first, say for like Muslim, first Muslim congressman, first Muslim, you know, whatever it is, most of the times it's an African-American person, right? It's not someone from the community. So just something to keep in mind. 
Inshallah. Um, the last question that we have before we open up the floor for Q&A. What are effective ways in which Muslims from non-black immigrant communities can include and uplift black Muslims without co-opting black experiences? This is a very difficult question, by the way. Okay, so I graduated a while ago. So a lot of these like terminologies I'm not very familiar with, like co-opting black experiences. I don't know what that means. But I'll tell you something. Um, and I know spaces. Spaces and narratives are like two of the most popular words that I hear in everything. I'll tell you something though, for me that's very interesting, and I, I found it to be very fruitful. Even amongst Africans, okay? A lot of Africans here? Okay, let me give an example. Have you ever been to Senegal? Yeah. Gambia? Yes. Yeah. Morocco? No. Egypt? Okay. <laughs> Let me tell you about the African experience. We go to our country, that's it, when it comes to Africa. If, and why do we do that? We go there because that's where our family is. But when it comes to my own hard-earned vacation money, it's Paris. It's London. It's, uh, I don't know, that's it. Uh, where else is there? Dubai? Okay. I don't know who would spend money going to Dubai, but my point is, my point is, I made a, a conscious decision a couple of years ago. Uh, my, myself and my wife and said, "Listen, I'll go to Europe for work, but I'm not volunteering to go to Europe. There's so much of Africa that I've never seen, and so uh, I think that it's something that we need to do, which is just go and see. And not only that, but." <coughs> It also breaks your idealism. You know, there's, it's a very, it's a, it's very true. If there is no enemy within, then the enemy without can do no harm. Let's not pretend that racism, America is a racist country. Okay, that's true. But guess what? Every other country is racist too. I'm from Sudan. I bear witness. You know, in Sudan, I'm white. Okay, I'm I'm from the ethnic majority in Sudan. So. I literally, the, the most clear examples in my life of racism I've ever seen were not here. They were in Sudan towards ethnic minorities there. But because I also had the black experience here, I'm very upset and like angry and arguing and fighting and, and people are like, what are you doing, man? It's like, it's like this ethnic minority, who cares about them? But they're like, the country's black people. And Sudan separated in 2011 because People said enough, enough second-hand citizenship. This is real. And it happens in Africa. And you would be looking at them and you probably think they were all black. Like they're all, but no. I mean, it's light skin versus dark skin. It's Arab origin versus African origin. It's this tribe versus that tribe. And that's throughout the entire continent. And so I think of the things that we can do, uh, number one is to, to actually travel. It will ground you. It will open up your horizons. It will mature your thoughts, have conversations with people. Uh, and number two is to actually you know, have the confidence to support each other, support each other. Uh, you know, people respect your, your buying power. And if you're going to always be spending it outside of your community, then you deserve to be forgotten and stepped on until you come to the sense of actually spending it with your people. I think the good thing about traveling is that it breaks all those misconceptions. I remember being 13 and driving through Dakar in Senegal and being like, oh my gosh, paved streets. These houses look really nice. And we went to all these fancy restaurants, even in Gambia, like all these seaside resorts. And yet the picture that's painted for you on TV is starving African children. And that's what you think the entire continent is. But Africa has a rich history. It's still got a lot of riches today to see. You know? <clears throat> That's one good thing about travel is that it just breaks every single misconception you have. And then going back to here, like Chef mentioned, when it comes to African American issues, such as African American voices, like I had this whole identity crisis starting from when I was 14. I don't know if it's even fully resolved, if I can even call myself African American, because the word, of, like I said, the phrase African American is used to refer to people whose ancestors were enslaved. So I would go back and forth with myself, do I have the right to claim that history as my own by calling myself African American? Uh, I've come to the conclusion now that that's 
part of my history because I am now here and then, like I said it's part of Muslim history, it's part of African history. So yeah, I am African American, just a different kind of African American. But when it comes to black issues, center black voices. You know, if we're going to have initiatives like this or any kind of thing the community wants to be involved in, let the black people take the lead and tell you what they need, how how to include the community more, what are the steps we need to take instead of saying, this is the problem, I think this is how we solve it. The people who are most affected, this is something we learn in policy too, the people who are most affected know the solutions to their own problems. Just let them take the lead, don't try to do it for them, don't try to like, recreate that white savior complex. Like Shahamar said, within our own communities, right, we recreate those racial hierarchies. But then within spaces like this, it's gonna be South Asian and Desi, and then blacks are, are gonna be towards the bottom. We have to be very cognizant and mindful to not recreate those hierarchies and not be the white savior with a, from whatever ethnicity you are from. And let those people who are most affected take the lead in the conversation and the action. Jazakallah khayran. With that, that ends our structured Q&A. That was where we want to hear from you guys. Um, who has questions, by the way? Just show of hands. Okay. I, I was expecting a lot more. Um, we'll work on that, inshallah. Um, okay, so we'll start with Sister Arva, if you want to come up to the mic and ask a question. You want to? If you don't want to, you can say it from there. I'll say it from here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so I was just going to pick you off like the last question that was about um, including, uh, I guess, us just as Muslims, including black Muslims in our lives and the Muslim community. Um, so as you guys were mentioning that there's this hierarchy even within our own cultures, I think the generation that at least I'm from and the younger generations, we're starting to be more accepting. Um, there's definitely more that we can do to include um, those of darker skins um, in our you know, daily lives. But I think we're, we're starting to get to that point where we're at least um, okay having conversations. But I've met a lot of older people who may be of immigrant communities that still have this concept in their heads, right? Of like this racist concept of like, someone's darker skin, um, so they must be like this, or they must be like that. And so I know this is a very difficult question, but what are your thoughts on how we can kind of help them you know, be more accepting and help them kind of open their eyes and kind of help them let go of the, the hierarchy that kind of exists in their heads? So I would say my initial reaction, my initial thought to a question like that is don't worry about them at all. Worry about your people, your generation, people who you can actually affect. I think one of the, the challenges that we have as the younger generation, to include myself amongst you guys here, is uh, you know the, the elders came and they came with a dollar in their pocket for those who immigrated. They built Masajid, they built 96th Street, they built Matthew Center, they built every masjid in the city, right? And I'll tell you I have a lot of uh, respect for ICNYU. Because that's probably the only message that I know of. There's a bunch of young people who said, we have a vision that's not being fulfilled in the city. And whereas everybody else would be sitting here arguing with a board of a masjid for 20 years, complaining, complaining, crying, the board, the elders, the uncles, this and that. They just said, we're going to start with a basement. We're going to start un un unpaid. You got the vision. People came to the vision. And it turned into one of the most active centers in the city. right? But it's, 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 it's just show me what you got. Don't tell me about it, show me. And so I think we need a lot more of that. If you have an idea, make it happen. Even a mother, by the way, a mother started like that. Shabhamda Sharif was 20-something years old, and he had a vision. And there are a lot of much more senior, much more knowledgeable shiuf who were like, he was translating for, he was a, he was a young shiuf translating for a bunch of senior shiuf. But he had this vision. Instead of just arguing back and forth with shiuf who are much more senior than him, that he has to, they have to change their ways. He's like, I'm going to show you. And then when they sh when they saw, they respected it, and they came on board. So I would just say, if you have a vision, if you want to, sh if you want, if you want, create the world that you want them to see. That's what I would say. Go out and do it. 
That was my first thought as well, just don't worry about it. But I also, this is my personal experience, but a close friend of mine did tell me that she had, was in, in that same situation in her home. And so she would start talking to her mom, and she'd be like, wow, that's racist. Don't say that, you know? And even at first, if her mom wasn't catching on, like afterwards, her mom would like actually came around and stop. So it's not going to happen right away. you got to like, keep knocking on the door. I see this a lot even with my younger brother. Like, I'll say something to him, and he acts like he's not listening, and then I'll later see him do it. It's like, uh, Right. So it's some, I guess you just gotta keep knocking at the door until it. Yeah. There's another question. All right. So, yeah. So, uh, Chef, you mentioned how we're trying to shift the discussion and make it more about like the black souls, like you mentioned. So, how can you shift the discussion and make it that like Islam is the, is the solution, like you said? By showing people that it's a solution, Islam is the solution by removing racism from your conversation. What 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 did what was Malcolm's like major epiphany moment is when he went to Hajj and he said this was the first time in my life that I saw people whose hair was the blondest of blonde and whose skin was the lightest of light and whose eyes were the eye uh, bluest of blue who sat down and ate with me and if they sat that they were white, he said, that was just something that was incidental about themselves. Just like, I'm from wherever, incidental. And, he, and for him, that experience was something that was very, very powerful for him. It was life-changing. And so I would say the same thing. Show people that this is something that, you know what, in your massage, show them in your relationships, show them in your conversations with in your support, your brotherhood, your fraternity, your sorority with each other, that you don't see color. And people will be attracted to that. We've got a long way to go, but it's what we should be working for. Yeah, just like how everyone else is very loud about what banner they're coming at us under, I feel like we also have to say, I'm doing this because I'm Muslim. I'm senior policy student, currently applying to all these kinds of things, and they asked me to talk about my public service. Tell us about your community involvement with um, underrepresented communities, like why do you do what you do? And so my resume is like full of MSA, YM, Omega, right? So it's like it's all there. And so when I'm talking about my experience, I'm talking about I got involved with this because of this Islamic organization. The reason why I do what I'm doing, why I'm interested in racial justice, is because Islam tells me to fight for justice however you can. And I'm a nerd, so I'm going to do it through policy. <laughs> you yeah? know? So just say it. And also show it. Like, I was talking about my boss. And the reason that he started to break down these misconceptions about Muslims is because I, I would just tell him, right? Um, and he would, like, I would just tell him, like, the reason that I don't like to take part like, when he starts complaining about other workers and all that, like, you, you see he's, like, the Muslims, like, in this office are some of the, the most peaceful, like, the best people that I know, you know? When you just go about it and say, like, yeah, this is how I am as a person, but it's, it's not because of me, it's because of his son. Then that's just how it starts spreading. Just don't keep it secretive. What, what's your secret to being such a nice person? It's because the Quran told me to. Okay. How does one define race? Sociological definition in your life? I can't tell you how one defines race. I mean, I can tell you how I know race. I mean, race is a social construct. That's the first. But then race is also how people see you and how you see yourself. So it's two parts, right? Like, there are a lot of people who are multiple ethnicities, multiple identities, and they feel like they might be alienated from one community or another because they don't outwardly look it, right? Or people who are black but just light skin, but they don't get treated that way because they're not seen as it, they don't have that same experience. So one race is like where you are in the world, someone says, okay, you're from Africa, you're black, but then are Egyptians black? No, they're Arab. They say, no, we're not Arab. I, I found it really interesting that like Middle Eastern people are supposed to be down Caucasian as their race and ethnicity. Um, I can't tell you how it is. All I know is what I learned in sociology, which is that it's both how you see yourself and how other people see you. But it's sure. What I like about that question is that we have to be clever enough and courageous enough to challenge terms and challenge the validity of terms. 
right? We just sometimes we just kind of assume, okay, everybody says there's race. So you know what? That's a really good question. What is a race? And are there races? Well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran is something very beautiful. He says, We created you, O mankind, we created you from a man and from a woman. And we made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. What does that mean that you may know one another? It's so that I can develop rapport with somebody. You know, some people get really offended when you say to them, Where are you from? And they're like, I'm from, I'm from, I'm from the earth. <laughs> you know, it's not a racistly loaded question. I'm asking you so that you could say that you're from the Bronx, right? And now, once you say that you are from the Bronx, guess what? Now I have so much that I can build rapport with you through. We could talk about the six train. We could talk about that's pretty much it. <laughs> we could talk about you know what I'm saying? Like the person says that I'm from New York. Boom. Now I've got so much that I can talk to you about. I have all of this information in my mind that I am going to download immediately, that file, New York. So the, I can ask you about people in New York. I can, do you know this person, right? All of a sudden, the Aruf is happening. You may know one another. I, you know, in, in countries where there are tribes, Allah says tribes in particular, man, this tribe thing is so powerful. Immediately, a person will say, uh, what tribe are you from? I'm from such and such tribe. Oh, I know so and so. Oh, that's my cousin. Boom. <laughs> now all of a sudden, like you created that relationship out of thin air. But if, if I don't know anything about that person, and they're not from a larger collective, it's much more difficult. Because now I have to get to know this person individually. I have nothing that I can build off of. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we created you into nations and tribes, why? For that purpose, for the development of relationships, for the development of rapport, for, uh, for that connection. And then Allah ends it by saying, the most perfect in the sight of God, is the one who's the most uh, conscious of him. Meaning that I didn't make you into nations and tribes that you could say you're better than each other. I didn't make you into nations and tribes that you can look down upon one another. At the end of the day, these nations and tribes that you're from don't make you better than anybody else. In fact, the best of you in the sight of God is not the person from this tribe or that tribe, or from this country or that country. But it is the person who's the most conscious of God. And by the way, even when we think that we are like beyond these types of things, we're, it's so deeply ingrained. You'll hear about a, 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 an airplane crash somewhere and they'll say seven Americans died. Okay? Like seven Americans died. Why that particular, like what about everybody else? Right? But there's supposed to be an additional, I guess, humanity to people. For, and it's the same in Canada, they'll say seven Canadian died or in, in wherever, they'll, they'll mention those people as if there's supposed to be more empathy for that particular group of people because they're from your nation, right? When we all believe that we're all human beings, we being the same, we cry the same, our loss is just as profound, right? So challenging these notions of being aware of them. Okay. Um, let me just see if you have a brother. You did? Okay. Uh, what's the best approach to uh, get that way in the black community? To, um, black Do you know one out of every five slaves who came over to the United States, and that's a low estimate, was Muslim. If they're coming from that area of West Africa, I mean, that's, and so you're talking about a history there. You're talking about, there's a, a very high, a very high chance that your ancestry in this country was Muslim. As far as giving da'wah to them, it's by simply doing that, giving da'wah. You know what's amazing? is that there's a, a conversation that happened between the, the ruler of the Byzantine Empire and one of the, one of the people of Mecca, Abu Sufyan. This is in Bukhari. Heraclius was quizzing Abu Sufyan about the nature of this prophet that they're saying had arisen from, from Mecca, from that city. And one of the questions that he asked him is he said, is he followed by the wealthy or is he followed by the poor? And he said, he's followed by the poor. He said, those are the followers of the prophets, the poor, the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the oppressed, those are the followers of the prophets. And so you will always find that to be the most uh, fertile soil for da'wah. You just have to go.
about um, like to just show people to them and not tell them and to remove race out of the discussion. And the I don't see To remove faith out of the discussion? No, race. Race. And I'm just wondering that is it dangerous to like go about it to the I don't see color perspective in a country like the United States which like systematically oppress people based off of color? I, I recognize that color exists very well. I don't have to be the person who's seeing color. Meaning that I recognize that color is being seen by everybody else. I'm not going to forget that this man is a black man in the United States, but in my interaction with him, I don't have to, I don't have to do that, right? Like, can there be a place where my color doesn't matter? I would appreciate that if I go to a place where I can be just me. Um, what was the second part to that, or was that it? Okay. Um, you can show people that you don't see color without specifically saying you don't see color. Chef, what you mentioned you're not up to date with all of the, the like, lingo, but people tend to get really offended sometimes when you say you don't see color because then you're saying you don't see part of that, right? Like you don't. I'm black. That's part of me. If you say you don't see color, then you're missing a part of it. So you don't need to say you don't see color because that is likely to be misconstrued. But then one thing that well, I would say, being yeah. black is a social construct. It is, it is but it's, it's one that comes with consequences. Consequences in what way? Like a black person is less likely to get a job, is more likely to be. But how does that? How does that? I understand all of that, and I recognize all of that. But how does that affect my interaction with this person? Um, it affects the way we're having ourselves when we're having coffee. It's like it's like a one to one. That's what I mean. Yeah, so you mean like in a one-to-one social interaction. It's not like I'm going to pretend. I'm going to tell him, just speed, man. Don't worry, man. The cops aren't going to pull us over. And he's black. No, but we are, we are going to get pulled over, right? So, yes. Yeah, I just want to say, I think that, um, like, where you don't wear blackness uh, doesn't matter. It's like in, in a homogeneously black setting or like a black country. And so, like, uh, to the question of does race exist, um, I think Islam definitely recognizes blackness um, because the Prophet Sallallahu talked about black uh, people. Um, and, and blackness, as we understand it, is radically different because of the system, but because we are in a system... But keep in mind, is, many of his Arab companions were black. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I understand. No, right. like his cousins. Yeah, his cousins. The, the, but, but yeah, there are black people. I, I just... Uh, uh, came to, uh, I, I read his book, Centering Black, uh, The so, African Arab. So blackness doesn't necessarily just mean, like, of African origin. Mm. Some of the Arabs from Quraysh were dark. Yeah, no, yeah but, what, but what I'm saying is, like, in, in the United States, blackness has, has a meaning that it didn't have before. Yes. But, but blackness in the United States, when you're, when you're interacting with someone, I think it's radically different than if you're interacting with someone who benefits from the system of racism, and I, I think that's where like differences. But if you're both sitting in like Senegal and you're both black, I don't think that that then it's a then we're telling a different story. But because we have to act in the system that they that they've set up here. And I also think, um, by the way, of the things that's very important, I, I keep coming back to this issue of kind of challenging everything because it's it's exhausting, but we need each other to do that. I recently, young people, right? They're hiring an imam. And of the things that they said in the job description was they said, you know, must have no uh, criminal record. And that, like, yeah. I sent them an email, like, no, you can't have that. Why? Because criminal record, number one, we have a community that's policed very, very differently. Two, uh, first of all, like, so many people convert in, in jail. And three, also, you, you have to be careful of absorbing values. Right now, our present society, the way it's constructed, they do, we do not accept the concept of change and repentance. We believe in repentance. I don't believe that a person at 20 years old is the same person that they are at 50. I don't, I don't expect that, especially if, if, they, if everything outside has changed. And so like, something as simple as criminal record, it's so damaging to people, right? It, it stops them from getting jobs. Starts to stop them from voting, stops them from a lot of access. Yeah, you're the policy. So it stops from a lot of different things. So we have to be very careful not to absorb these systemic uh, oppressive practices in our.
in our daily lives. Malcolm X spent years in prison. He had like an eighth grade education. He wouldn't have gotten hired. He, he, he had an eighth grade education, read like every book in the prison library, and that's how he became the eloquent, well-read man we know him to be. So that's just one example. All right, guys, so last question. Let's make a count. Um, okay. How about I hear no, 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 all of you guys' questions? No, I'm good. I'm good. Then, okay, guys, I have a really good idea. Let me hear everyone's questions, uh, and let's just see. Right. Okay, so we'll do both, inshallah. Um, we'll start with Dominique. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say, mine wasn't a question, that's why I was like, Go for it. But it was just more of a comment, and I just wanted to say um, how awesome that this event was, because I'm non Muslim. Um, but I want to thank oh, I want to thank them for inviting me to come to this event because I feel like I learned so much more than my entire time being at John Jay or working here or So you're you know saying I, I showed up to John Jay for twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I just showed I'm up to John Jay for twenty minutes. Here and I've oh, okay. here for the past seven years. It's like, oh, in this one event I learned so much more and I wish that there were a lot more non-Muslim um, individuals that came to here because I feel like, especially someone who was born here and raised in the school system that we have, we don't learn this at all. This is probably maybe the first time I've ever even heard, oh, let's talk about history before slavery. Mm -hmm. We don't learn that here. And I just thought that was really amazing that you brought that up and it really makes you think. Because I'm always like, well, what happened before that? Like, so y'all just pull these people from here, but how did you know about them? What were their lives like before they even got here? So I just thought it was really great that you brought that up. And I just wanted to know, like, as someone who is non-Muslim, how do you continue the conversation? <laughs> All right, let's take the other question. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Adam. Thank you so much for coming. My question is like, how do we move forward uh, to teach our younger generation, the people coming after us, how to see color? Like, are they supposed like because I've been like inside of the community and I've been even having like uh, people next to me who have an uncle flag as a neighbor, and I have my uncle who's Muslim who lives in this type of neighborhood. <coughs> Interact with the kids, with the same the kids of both or family, but the African, the African, I mean, as African, they don't, the kids don't really understand or uh, in what social structure they are right now. And sometimes he asks himself this question: How do we move forward, even though they know about uh, all of them, I mean, about the religion? How do you teach them about race, and how should they feel about it? Because okay. I at eight years old, you don't know about race, maybe. I, 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 so you just triggered something in my mind with regards to the Confederate flag issue. So I, I moved from New York to Houston, and something that I believe in very much, even though it may not be uh, very popular in certain spaces, okay, is, uh, I just used that word, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> uh, yeah, in certain spaces, is, is the notion that I need to figure out I need to I need to be able to build bridges of understanding. <coughs> I don't believe in vilifying white people. I don't believe in that at all. Okay? And I don't believe that everybody who is even holding a Confederate flag or what have you, I don't believe that it's just some sort of monolithic uh, experience. I think everybody, and even with regards to everybody who voted for the current president and what have you, if you go to these towns and places, you will find a lot of pain. You will find a lot of desperation. You will find a lot of broken promises. You will find a lot of anger at the political classes that have made them promises and have left them forsaken. And I don't think that people voted for uh, whoever that they voted for. They didn't vote for all, all for the same reason. One of a uh, really uh, powerful exercise that I think people should do, one of my chef actually mentioned this uh, in a communications class, he said, the professor took a very polarizing topic. Who's on this side? Everybody on this side, raise their hands. Okay, now who's on this side? Everybody on the other side, raise their hand. And then he said, okay, now everybody who's taking position A, for the purposes of the class, you are gonna take position B. And you are going to argue their position for them. And the other 
you know, people who had taken position B, they are going to argue position A's position for them. And they spent the entire class arguing each other's positions passionately and everything. And then at the end, the professor asked them and said, well, who here has changed positions by arguing the position of the other side? So almost nobody changed their position. And what does that show you? It shows you that it's not threatening to me and my conviction for me to just go on to the other side and, and try to look and see what they see. Right? But what, what that will create is understanding, maybe even create some empathy. And it should definitely create the ability to communicate with them, to understand. And so I think that uh, that's number one for sure. And actually, I'm uh, part, of, part, of, uh, part of what I fear with regards to the way that some people talk with regards to white people is that you are actually, uh, we believe, Everybody, everybody is a creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And so sometimes we even have that. We have one white converts who will walk into a masjid and say, I didn't find any welcome. Mm -hmm. Is that what we want? No, not if we say that Islam is something that's a, a, uh, is a source of peace for all people, including white people, right? And so when we talk about not seeing color and raising a generation that not, not sees color, with all of the disclaimers that were put about seeing color and not seeing color and all of that, I think that we need to make sure that we are truly inclusive and that we include everybody. And then on the topic of kids not understanding race, you can actually be really surprised. They might not have the terminology to talk about it, but the kids like, absorb everything around them. They've done experience uh, experiments with kids that are like three, four, five, maybe like five to seven years old, right? And they'll have two dolls, a black doll and a white doll. And then the interviewer will ask, which one of these dolls is a good girl? And even the black child will point to the white doll. Which one of these is a bad girl? They'll point to the black doll. Black and white children, like, this is ingrained. Like, they don't even know that they've been taught to see their own skin color as something negative. But kids do absorb and they do listen. Like, after a whole week to everything, there was, I just saw this story of this one third grade teacher who was teaching the kids about consent. And so she put it in terms of understand, like, can I give you a hug? Like, do you want a handshake? Is it okay if I touch you? Um, and kids understand and they, they would start doing it. So you just have to put it in a way they understand. But the great thing about starting them off like that is that a lot of us, by the time we got to high school or college, we had to start decolonizing our minds. Mm -hmm. Had to stop looking at other black people and thinking negatively of them even though we are black ourselves, right? So the good thing about starting them off younger is that they don't have to go through that, through that painful process of taking away the negative conceptions about themselves and their own community because they already came up that way and then they can spread that amongst themselves, amongst others. We had an event like this at our masjid in the Bronx and there's a sweet little girl there, she's like nine years old. I think her name was Sakina. You don't remember Sakina? Um, and she was telling us how, we were all talking about like our experiences and someone just mentioned like in school a lot of the time we were called and then everyone in the audience was like African blue scratcher. I don't know where that came from, but like every African kid will tell you they've been called African blue scratcher, right? This little girl, she raised her hand, we're all like college age and older. She raised her hand and she told us that like, in her third grade class, someone had said that to her and she was like, no. I believe in myself and I believe that I, I have self-worth and you're African too. You just don't know it, right? And this is like an eight, nine year old girl just like spewing it. So when you teach kids this, it really empowers them and they can spread that amongst their eight year old friends and we don't know what kind of ripple effect that has until it has, you know? But back to the other question, Dominique was it, right? Um, about how do we continue the conversation? I just remembered, I was at the Majlis Ashura banquet two weeks ago, and Majlis Ashura is the uh, New York like Muslim organization. It's sort of like the um, coalition. coalition. It, it's an umbrella organization. A lot of um, mosques in the U.S. I, I mean, in New York, a lot of mosques, student groups, um, even on Maghreb, they was part of it too, now, right? Was so, so not that? Okay, but MSAs are part of it too. So it's this big umbrella group that represents all these organizations. And one of the older members, Imam Talib al Rashid, he got him on stage. He was one of the introductory speakers. He went like way over his time, I'm over there trying to get him off and everything. But he was like, I have to say this. Developing relationships with the black community leaders is not the same as developing relationships with the black community. 
right? And you've got Muslim leaders from all over the city, all different ethnicities there, and he's laying it down on them. And I'm like, I'm glad you're doing this while we're all here, right? Uh, so it's like an action item to us all. Developing relationships with Imam Sarah College is not the same as developing relationships with Bed Stuy in Brooklyn, right? We see, and someone even did her master's thesis on this at Princeton about how Masjid Taqwa worked to during the uh, crack, crack epidemic to remove all of that from the streets in their neighborhood, right? Black Muslim communities are on the ground doing these kinds of things, and we need to reach out just past like building relationships with the Imam and really get down to the community level, and then. That's how we continue the conversation. That's how we build that coalition. And I saw your hand too. So, yeah, you're the last one. Um, how do we bring the notion of black ghetto people and black community? Oh, Kurt, thank you for asking that. <laughs> because when I was in high school, I was told that I sound like a ghetto valley girl. And I was like, what does that mean? But of course, I understood perfectly what that means, right? They're telling me, sometimes you sound like you're white, but sometimes you say things that sound like you're black, right? And it's something I've had to like, question myself back and forth with. When I'm in certain communities, am I going to talk away, or am I a, a certain way, or am I not? And I've come to the conclusion, like, I'm just going to talk how I talk. If it means that you think I sound like I go, but sometimes I say things that make you see that from the Bronx, then I'm just going to do that, you know? I'm just going to be me. Be like both broke and bougie, tell you I'm from the Bronx. I don't like spending money on things and then go spend four dollars on coffee at Fred. But it's just like I don't I don't know what else to say but just don't play into the stereotypes because these things perpetuate a lot of times because we allow them to perpetuate, like we feel like we have to fit the mold so we continue to play into that part even if it's not who we really are. So just be both bougie and Get out, ratchet, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> and just show like that. That doesn't that doesn't define your honor. The way you speak doesn't define your honor. You know, some of the best clips you listen to are from imams who won't use like proper grammar. I really don't like when black people feel the need to tell other people that they speak with proper grammar because what is proper grammar? Like we talked about earlier, like I can tell you the sociological um, origins of race, right? But who decides what is standard English? people who are in charge, right? So, British have decided that this kind of English, the British colonialists, even though they're here in America, have decided this is standard English. Everything else is a dialect that is not proper to be used in official speech. Shouldn't talk in African American dialect, shouldn't talk in a Texan dialect, even though I've seen people in Texas give, like, people <coughs> speak just saying y'all and all that stuff, because for them, that's still formal, right? So just don't play into the notion. All right, um, so that's actually going to conclude the Q&A. I know everybody here had some brilliant questions. Um, so one round of applause to all of you guys. <laughs> Two, before we do continue to our last portion, um, I just wanted to really thank Dominique for coming. She is demonstrating with us. Um, so, you know, like Dominique is a very, very helpful person for you, and I wanted to thank her for coming. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to go through some announcements. And then after the announcements, we had, oh, okay, so we're gonna use token word first, I think, apparently. Um, all right, so uh, I know, Mariama, Sister Mariama, you had something prepared for spoken word, right? Well, maybe it's just like specifically for this, but okay. yeah, um, just to stop with that for me. So I used to write, Poetry and spoken word a lot more when I was younger, and I found that a lot of times, like the spoken word that I was really involved around race, because like I said, I had like all those confusions about where I fit into the whole black American narrative, especially because being both black and Muslim in America, like I had my own experience being black Muslim woman, and the fact that I wear hijab and people see me and they see that I'm visibly Muslim over the fact that my brother who obviously isn't wearing a job, but when people see him, the first thing they see is they see black and so they see threat. So a lot of the times when I, I see these things about black men and young boys being killed, like I just think of my younger brother who's now 15, like 6'1", six 6'2", six and he's still got the baby face, and what does that mean for him going out into the world? So yeah, I used to write a lot about that. Here's something like last year. Huh? Yeah, I think I'm gonna stand up. Thank you.
Can someone explain to me how you can be arrested for resisting arrest, I ask? When you're not white, anything is possible. The overachievers, a lot of us. Reach for the stars, you might end up six feet under for thinking too highly of yourself. For thinking you're worth something, for thinking you're worth the good life, for not restricting you to the box they've been trying to stick you in for centuries now, but you, pesky Negroes, won't let yourself stay trapped. Always gotta go around thinking you deserve better. Always gotta go around thinking you're worth much more than what they teach you in school. That's dangerous, you know. A Negro with confidence, with integrity, with a high sense of self-esteem. Who does she think she is acting like the white way is not the right way? Can someone explain to me how you can be arrested for resisting arrest? Because our existence is an act of resistance. To go about your day believing your skin is not a crime, that is a crime. To believe that you are worthy of humanity and respect, that is a crime. To believe that you deserve an education that is not surrounded by barbed wire. A school with public safety instead of real police. To believe that you deserve detention instead of a headlock and a smackdown in the principal's office, that is Right. To believe that you are worth something in this world was your first mistake and your biggest crime. Punishable by death in court of officer's trigger finger and the grand jury will say, yeah, he did it. But where in the law did it say he was wrong though? And the news will say, yeah, he did it. But did you know the victim got detention once? Got in trouble by his mama once when he was a kid? The evidence is there, he's a bad apple. The evidence is there, the officer killed him, but he was a bad apple. The activists will say enough is enough. The dark people will say nowhere outside our doors is safe, but we will go out anyway. We will not fear. Not fearing is a crime. His mama will say he didn't do nothing, and she's right. But that don't mean her boy was black. Or that he wasn't killed by a badge atop a blue shirt, atop a white skin that turned blue and it can't breathe, and the street will say. I am choking with all of this blood. I still try to make myself soft for the black boy. For the black boy who dared to live as he falls. But nobody is listening anymore. Is it wrong with me to feel like I'm doing me? Like there's only a matter of time before I'm next? What a powerful position you must hold to commit an act of resistance by simply existing. They made it a crime to be this black, bold, beautiful, and all officers have standing orders to confiscate your radiance, and they will try. Oh, they will try. But it is impossible to separate a current from a wave or a wave from a current. You see, what they're really doing is just setting fire to ash, because when you burn ash, you're still left with just ash. It's the same thing you started with. That is to say their efforts are futile. That is to say they tried to destroy us to find that nothing has changed. That is not to say that we are merely ashes, but that we are the phoenix that arises from that which they tried to destroy us through. And is that not black culture? Is that not resilience? Is that not stand your ground? This ground has been nourished on my blood for so long. It has become an acquired taste. When no one else will take us, this ground always has open arms to take us in, help us bloom where we are planted. You know, I never understood that phrase, bloom where you're planted, how that's an inspirational phrase, but I get it now. To bloom where you're planted is, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeds. To bloom where you're planted is to be the weeds that kill southern trees that bear strange fruit. To bloom where you're planted is to be the flower that gives its birth even to the hand of crushing. And it crushes you. Understand that this hurts. This is the kind of hurting that don't take a break. So Lena Fulton can't take a break. John King can't just write about movies today. You look in your brother's face and you remember why you can't take a break because hurting won't stop until we make them stop hurting. It seems like all I can think about these days is the politics of staying alive. And how can I not when my body is a house on fire that nobody believes is worth saving? But I'm fighting. <laughs> just exists every day. When my mere existence is an act of existence, then where is the time for anything else? Thank you. All right, so now I want to call up our very own John Genesis, Sister Smack.
Well, we're going to have a flight guy to take a lot of care of the people here this morning. God forbid she had given up on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 